for the Los Angeles Review of Books. I'm Colin Marshall coming to you from Los Angeles Review of Books LARB headquarters here in Silver Lake, Los Angeles, California. Speaking today with a writer who is here visiting for a fairly short period of time, a shorter period of time than she's been here before. She's also written a Los Angeles novel called The Pink Hotel, which is out now in America. She is Anna Stothard. She is visiting from London. Anna, welcome. And first, I want to ask you about this this moment in the book where your narrator, teenage girl here from London, she describes being in Los Angeles and noticing that everybody's passing through different dimensions. Is that an observation you'd put to yourself in those words before? I lived in Thai town in Little Armenia uh, in this um, apartment block full of just all these different sorts of people. And I found that I, not driving, I have never driven. And um, I just found that I walked this version of Los Angeles that none of my friends seemed to know anything about. Mm. And I'd walk out of my apartment and there would be a huge Armenian wedding going on. And then you'd pass through the crowds of these Armenians and you'd get a uh, Thai children peeling oranges on a street corner for a, a Thai altarpiece. And the Armenian men never whistled at me. The Armenian men never seemed to talk to the Thai people. There were all these different just layers of the city that nobody, that nobody, then they didn't seem to cross over. And then a porn star would jog by and the Thai people wouldn't notice the porn star. And I like this idea that everyone says that LA is all these suburbs looking for a city. But actually in every little bit of Los Angeles, there were so many um, different layers and you just have to look beyond the cliche of Los Angeles and you get this this crazy mishmash of of um of of people and situations your narrator in the pink hotel this young lady notices this phenomenon when she she herself is she finds herself not getting whistled at by the armenian men they only see the armenian women which you've just alluded to and it's this it's this seeing all the dimensions of Los Angeles, experiencing all of them, that living here, I feel like that's that's the main pitfall to avoid is, is getting into just your dimension. Would you agree with that? Is that a strategy for living here? Absolutely. And so many people hate it. And there is this top layer of Los Angeles, which is absolutely every cliche that people say about LA is completely true. And Where, where had- did you find that top layer, by the way? Oh, if you go to West Hollywood and you go clubbing, um, not that I did very much of that, um, or just, I mean, the industry parties and things on the rare occasions that I ended up there, mm. it was exactly like you would expect. And it's very easy to stay in that. I mean, if you if you want to sort of just stay on this very glossy surface level of a city. Mm. And that's just not where the well, not where I found any of the fun of Los Angeles and any of the um, insanity and the creative force that that um, drove me to stay here. Mm. Now we'll talk about why you came here originally, but why is your narrator in the Pink Hotel in Los Angeles? She comes. She's this very androgynous. Um, difficult kid who's grown up not really knowing anything about affection and she plays football and she thinks that pain is the closest thing that she has to um intimacy in her childhood and she's been brought up by her dad in london off the finchley road and she plays football and then she finds out that her mom who she's never really known who left when she was three years old um is dead and she has been in la and she died um on a motorcycle in the in the desert and she used to run this huge pink hotel in venice beach and so the little girl who's nameless throughout rocks up to her mother's funeral which is banging in a in in the hotel and she pulls her grubby baseball cap over her head and steals a whole bunch of her mom's beautiful clothes and photographs and her mom was this decadent um, 
luxurious, beautiful creature who was very loved by a lot of men. Mm. And then the androgynous little girl sort of starts to discover her mother and discover herself as she returns all these love letters to the men who knew them. Now, Richard Rayner, the novelist, the English novelist who now lives, I believe, in, in Venice and who writes for us at the Los Angeles Review of Books, wrote, of course, the book, the novel, Los Angeles Without a Map, about 25 years ago, which also followed an English narrator coming to Los Angeles, riding buses around in search of in search of somebody in, in some sense. Do you, and I, I can also think of Englishmen in Los Angeles novels, like a, like, a, like a single man or real people like David Hockney. Is there a tradition of, of Britons in Los Angeles you felt like this story, The Pink Hotel, joins at all? Um, or is that, is that a tradition you're even aware of in the first place? I mean, calling it a tradition might be excessive, but is it something... Is it something you think of as a thing? I'll say that. I can't say I ever did, no. I mean, I was aware of, of um, Los Angeles Without a Map and his brilliant journalism, particularly a fantastic article he wrote about not driving here. And I don't drive here either. In fact, I just got the bus here and I felt so nostalgic as I got on the bus and there was this girl just tweaking on meth or something, uh, uh, uh. talking to me about how I'd dissed her to the president. And then these other two people who hadn't seen each other in ages met on the bus and stuff. And it was like theatre. Mm. And I felt very nostalgic for my, my bus journeys, my theatrical bus journeys around Los Angeles. But Ray I know what you mean. really well about that. He does. I, I don't have a car myself, so I took the bus here as well. We're in Silver Lake, which is... The trains don't go here yet. Lord knows when that will be. But... I only moved to Los Angeles a few years ago, and it seems, if not normal, then acceptable that somebody would not have a car here now. When you first came here, I guess that was that was it regarded as an eccentricity, like it was for Richard Rayner, thirty or whenever years ago he came here. Yeah, for sure. People mm. thought I was insane, <laughs> um, and maybe I was in a way. I mean, it, it's the buses are great in some ways they're cheap and they and they they're much better than people think they are certainly but yeah people just are oh, the looks i used to get you turn up turn up and people would be amazed i think as a girl as well you would get a lot of like walking in la people would assume i don't know they, you definitely got weird weird looks walking really? in la yeah and I got into a lot of trouble. I got, got like, I, I also have a terrible sense of direction. I mean, oh. really, really awful. Mm. And so I was always getting horribly lost in LA. Getting lost here is not the worst strategy to get a handle on the place, though, is it? No, that's mm. true. And, and well, like I say about the bus trip over here, you see a lot of, you know, a lot of things that you wouldn't if you were in your car going mm. straight from A to B. You end up at the strange grocery store where you bump into some random person and and interesting things happen, which is a very, you know, in other cities that happens all the time. You have um, strange interactions and um, on the tube or, or in, whereas in LA, a lot of it is everyone's in their car, so everyone just goes from A to B and you have to know where you're going. Mm. Whereas it's great not knowing where you're going. It seems to be, I mean, London has, has established that sort of thing for, I, I don't even want to, I don't even want to put the number out there because you'll see, I'm drawing the comparison to Los Angeles, that the city itself seems to be breaking out of that very slowly and very recently. I mean, do you get the sense, do you get any sense of visiting Los Angeles so that there might be, there might be a little more of the strange encounters for, for everyone, a little less of the point A to point B-ism in, in whatever way they might have been locked into it before? I don't know. I'd like mm. to spend more time here and and, and find that out. Mm. When when did you know you wanted to put a character through this journey, through this to to plunge her into Los Angeles, get her on the buses, get her having to put in a lot of manual labor searching through this city? I'd had the idea for the book for quite a long time. Um, I found a bunch of my mom's love letters um, in her room when I was a teenager. Mm -hmm. And I'd always sort of had this idea. 
and I'm quite close to my mom and I had this idea of this this relationship between the dead mom and the girl and and finding an identity through that um but never really knew where to put it and then yeah after this road trip around California and Nevada I rocked up at at the Cadillac Hotel in Venice Beach and I vividly remember having a cigarette on the fire escape and looking out on what looked like a kind of hologram Icadia of a beach mm. with all these, you know, there was a guy playing the piano on a, you know, full piano in the street and people making sand mermaid sculptures and and this amazing hotel with its incredible atmosphere and the whole city with this flat white eerie light and the heat and I remember thinking I could definitely definitely set a coming of age story also a coming of age story I think that LA was it's a city that's so obsessed by story Mm. everyone here is not everyone but a lot of people are sort of constructing themselves people come here to become something they become here to become um, a producer or an actor everyone's talks about their marriages in terms of three-act structure and their childhood as backstory. Um, and there's a lot of, a lot of yearning and it's, it's kind of wonderful that everyone, everyone thinking in, in stories and arcs. Mm. And I just thought that it would be a perfect place to have a little girl trying to construct her own identity. Mm. You have this narrator in the Pink Hotel observe that, observe somebody in a cafe talking about how their marriage had hit, the turnaround, the first act turnaround, something like that. And it is easy to laugh at, even if you live here, maybe especially because it's like, oh, the screenwriters, you know, you see them everywhere. They've got the laptops open to final draft. And it's it's, it's very much a cliche here. But you're a novelist, so you have to be thinking as well that... They're speaking in these screenwriting cliches, but also those those screenwriting concepts wouldn't be so etched in stone if they weren't drawn from actual importance and meaning in our lives. Do you know what I mean? That's a little bit tangled, but if, if it yeah, makes sense. I know exactly what you mean. And I don't think, I mean, it is a cliche in a way, but mm. as I, I mean, I always think it was wonderful. Mm. I mean, it's... Like we, we, we like first act turnarounds. We know what those are because our lives actually have them. That's why we like them in movies, right? Yeah. And you're putting this construct into into your own life and, and and fitting you know, you're not necessarily making yourself into fiction. You're trying to find a way to explain um explain yourself and explain your motivations and your and your desires, which is even if you're you know, that's what writing is. It's a desire to to, to find a way to express um difficult subjects. Mm. Um, and so I, I mean, I think it was wonderful and it, it does, I mean, the cliche of it can get superficial and it, I think it probably can. I think it sent me slightly insane by the end. I remember when I decided I wanted to leave LA, which I was walking down. I lived, um, just near Charles Bukowski's favorite liquor store, which is called the pink elephant. Mm. And I was lived sort of four doors down from there. And I remember I was walking to get cigarettes and I passed and there was all this um, coroner's tape and um, lots of policemen. And I'd been there for about two, two and a half, two and a bit years. And um, I immediately thought that it was an episode of CSI or, and I thought, oh, you know, I wonder if I can make any contacts. Um, and then I got to the top and then I was, I got, got a little bit past and I thought, oh no. It was like some guy had been cut up into tiny, tiny little pieces and put all over in all the dumpsters around the area. And I remember thinking, that's really bad that I thought that was fiction, (laughs) that my life has become so confused (laughs) that 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 was, it it was all, all artifice and, and, and I wanted to make contact and someone was dead. And I remember thinking, I should probably leave now. Right. Did you think? I should probably use this in fiction because I believe that makes its way into the pink hotel. And there's a bit about a blender and a smoothie and some body parts in there as well. Maybe that spices the whole thing up. Um, oh yeah, that's true. There was a, there was a, um, yeah, he made a blueberry smoothie. Oh, that's real. Uh-huh. Oh my, I, I wasn't aware of this story. I guess this was slightly before I came here. Mm-hmm. So I didn't have that moment, 
of thinking that it might I didn't see the actual police tape and think it might have been fiction, but I do live on the block in Koreatown that they shoot New York police dramas on because I guess it's the one plausible block. So it's not unusual to see the rack of fake NYPD cars there. And think that's, <laughs> I mean, that's what they, they do here. But I want to get a sense of, well, for the audience, let's lay this out. I mean, you, you told us about the moment when you wanted to leave Los Angeles. So how did you get here? Well, I went on a road trip, um, sleeping in the back of a friend's car. And we were out for sort of two weeks and she ended up in, in um, San Francisco and I ended up, yeah, at this giant pink hotel called the Cadillac on Venice Beach. And I absolutely had no plans to stay here. I thought that I would hate it. Mm. I thought it would be like walking through a glossy magazine. I'm very pale. Um, I hate the beach. Disaster <laughs> on holiday. Yeah, I can't think of anything worse than a pool party. And thought I would hate it. And then I absolutely fell in love with this incredibly elemental city that's always bracing itself for forest fires and and earthquakes and drought with this incredible light and where you sort of find coyotes in the Rite Aid parking lot and snakes in the swimming pool. Mm. And absolutely fell in love with it. Like I've never fallen in love with a city before or a place or, or anything. And I never went home. I, uh, well, I, I didn't go home. I enrolled in the American Film Institute and spent two years studying screenplay writing. In the novel, your narrator, of course, starts out in Venice Beach, and she spent some time in West Hollywood, walks Hollywood Boulevard. So for a while, I'm thinking to myself, well, she's probably not going to go any farther east of this, because for some reason, characters don't tend to, and especially English characters in, in Los Angeles stories, they, they stay to the West, generally speaking. But, you know, I was glad to see Little Armenia and Thai Town make their way in here. Is there? Do you have a sense of those places and others as well? I mean, she gets all over the city. Even even Chinatown. I mean, Ch Chinatown is a movie, but these these areas are not represented really in Los Angeles stories, are they? Do you have that sense? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's amazing how for such a beautiful city the LA literature is so dark mm. um, not just the noir stuff that LA is so famous for um, outside of America but you know Joan Didion and um, well Brett Easton Ellis and Dana Spiotta and this incredible sense of dissonance that comes into into LA literature and in terms of, of, of where that is, I mean, I think these, these places that are so difficult to grasp. I mean, living in Thai town and little Armenia, it was so hard to, it was so utterly unexpected. And you could really sense the darkness underneath the sunshine. Hmm. The difficulty of grasping these places, it's not just to do with the fact that two given people may not speak any of the same languages, does it? Or, or that it's just so big. I mean, London is huge. Los Angeles is huge. London has people from everywhere. Los Angeles has people from everywhere. What is what is the difference in difficulty? What can we chalk up the difference in difficulty to? Well, in my experience of London... And although there are distinct communities, for sure, they're not called different things. I mean, they're not, they're all places where, you know, a lot of um, Indian people live or a lot of Chinese people live. But at the same, but it's, it's not like there are different towns. Mm -hmm. There's no, there's no. Koreatown, where I where I live, for one example. Yeah, they're probably Korean people. There are Korean people and there are Korean pockets. Um, actually, I have no idea. I don't know if there are Korean <laughs> there's, pockets, there's but probably. probably. That, I mean, it's yeah, huge. Come doubt, on. There's probably yeah. some, some Korean pockets in London. Um, yeah, but they're not these, these very distinct bubbles that are... I think what's crazy about LA is that these bubbles, like I say, that are on top of each other, yet distinct. Hmm. And they just pass each other in the street but they don't they don't connect 
mm. which I guess is that that darkness and that that disconnection that so much LA literature deals with. Does the difficulty of understanding Los Angeles make it harder to write about in fiction, or do you end up having to write about characters uh, capturing a character's difficulty understanding it? Does that make sense? Well, it's great fun to write about a character um, trying to understand a place. Mm. Um, in the Nowhere City, what's her name? Catherine says that, that one of the things she hates about Los Angeles is that the grapefruit that the oranges are as big as grapefruits and the grapefruits are as big as advertisements for grapefruits. Hmm. Ah, um, I haven't heard that line. <laughs> and she she well obviously and I think that kind of sums up this there's this huge potential in Los Angeles. There's this sense that you come here and you can be anything you want to be. But and you know, teeth are insanely white here and and everyone is insanely beautiful on on one level but then there's a disconnect between that and <laughs> most of the people who actually live here you have a variety of american characters in the book of course that your narrator interacts with some who have been in los angeles a very long time indeed do you think do you think these characters understand these qualities of los angeles as well as an outsider like your narrator does quickly? Probably not, but only because um, I do travel writing as well. And I think that there's something wonderful about seeing a place for the first time that you can't, you don't nef necessarily understand it better than someone who's lived here for many, many years, but you understand it very differently. Mm. And you can maybe see the exact color of red or describe it in a way that that if someone had seen that color of red a hundred times before they wouldn't even notice it mm -hmm. um so i wouldn't say that the um narrator of the pink hotel understands la better she probably understands it a lot worse and but she understands she sees it in a in a very clear and um emotional way because mm. it's the first time somebody embedded in say the uh, celebrity photography industry might not might have gone blind to certain qualities of it a long time ago yeah exactly mm. and the the love interest in the book um is yeah he's a paparazzi a failed a failed fashion photographer and now paparazzi <laughs> um and yeah he's i suppose everyone i mean la we were saying before, LA is such an imaginary city on so many levels. People, you know, you're you're in in downtown and and you recognise a scene from Double Indemnity, or or you recognising um, sort of crime scene things on the TV from near where you live, and it's incredibly familiar in a way, yet in a dreamy in a dreamy sense, but also um, very alien. Mm. Um, so I think. It is so much what you project onto it, the city, more more than most cities. And David sees David is is the paparazzi. You know, he sees the dark the the dark parking lots outside strip clubs where he's trying to <laughs> catch X and Y walking out of them. Um, whereas the girl, yeah, sees a completely different version of this mythic city. You mentioned crime stories, double indemnity. You know, we think of James M. Cain, we think of Raymond Chandler, a lot of a lot of stories that Los Angeles has produced, you know, the entire run of Dragnet has been, they've been crime stories, detective stories. Now that I think about it, that seems very, very dis disproportionately crime and detective stories. What formal similarity, if any, do you think that your narrator's journey to find out about her mother, what, what, f does it share the form of the detective story in your mind at all? Yeah, in a way, it, it absolutely does. She finds these these letters at the beginning, and it's not a detective story in a Chandler way, but she is trying to solve a puzzle, yeah. for sure, um, because she knows nothing about this um, this mother of hers that she's she's been told tiny little snippets about. She was a bad mother. She was a slut. She was you know all these horrible things, 
And then she gets to LA and finds this giant pink hotel and her husband and all these different lovers. And she tries to fit together the mother's personality by going on this quest through Los Angeles. Um, and simultaneously, she is sort of the um, innocent person who stumbles into something that she she shouldn't have done mm. um, because the she steals all these stuff that she's just doing it out of curiosity. She just wants the red stilettos, <laughs> but she steals this, this suitcase that has other things in it. And mm. so the husband, um, the mother's husband is then looking for her. So she's going around trying to sweetly find out about her mother or not so sweetly in some ways mm. um, while this ominous husband is trying to find the suitcase and various papers in the suitcase. It's this truism I keep hearing mentioned about screenwriting that you want to put a character on a journey and you want to keep throwing roadblocks up in front of the character's desire, putting them between the character and their desire. What type of... What type of... What, what type of word am I looking for? Um, mm -hmm. When you're learning these principles at AFI, say, what what applies back to writing a novel? Does any apply back to writing a novel? Are there, are there things you learned there that you could bring to writing traditional fiction rather than writing screenplays? Absolutely, I think. And, and when I left LA, I sort of fell out of love with cinema and LA sort of simultaneously. And I basically decided that I really am not a team player. <laughs> no good with people. Mm. Um, and obviously screenplay writing is... Although, you know, you write the screenplay maybe on your own or with one person, but it's such a collaborative process, mm. which I just couldn't deal with on any level. So that was a failure. But I think the the structure of it, I mean, all the things that we were mocking earlier or, or I sort of mock in the book and the um, the constructs that you put on reality to turn it into a story mm. and to make it, make it accessible, which is stuff that, you know, has been used since the, you know, beginning of storytelling is incredibly useful to learn. And it is, you know, how to create a character arc, um, how to, how to pace, how to, yeah, how to make sure that everything is constantly moving forward mm. and constantly full of conflict are all, yeah, incredibly useful things to have learned. And as well, after you had fallen out of love with Los Angeles screenwriting, cinema, collaboration, was there some sense in writing novels you want to, you know, I, I want to write something that is very much not a screenplay, very much the opposite. Is that impulse there too? It's certainly my instinct is to write is to write prose mm. and to sort of discover a character as I write. I just, you know, certainly discovered my little nameless narrator as, as she went along and she was constantly surprising me. And I found it quite difficult with screenplays. Yeah. I, I always just wanted to write everything about the character. Mm. Maybe it was being a bit of a control freak. <laughs> But this character we've said is nameless, and she's not sexless, but she is androgynous, as you've mentioned. How much, how deliberately did you want to have her be a bit of a blank to to herself at the beginning? Very much so. Um, I really wanted to play around with this idea of someone who, I mean, she's not identityless as it happens. She actually has quite a distinct identity as a tomboy, as violent, as a little bit of a kleptomaniac. Um, but who thinks of herself as a ghost and she thinks she's invisible. She thinks she can walk around places and hide and no one will see her. And yeah, she's thinks she's sexless as well. And as someone pointed out, she probably isn't because she gets, <laughs> gets quite a bit of action in the book yes. quite, quite early on. <laughs> so she's probably not quite as sexless as she thinks she is. Uh, a different kind of action than she got in England, no doubt. I mean, a different kind of everything. And she got in England, right? I, I forget. I keep forgetting that the character is English, not because you, not because you didn't write her Englishness enough or whatever, but that stops being a salient point. It seems to me it's it's not the it's not the salient point about her. This isn't this isn't a fish out of water story because she's English, right? There's that's part of it, but 
that's not was that in your head as how much how important was that in your head that she happened to be english i don't think very important mm. at all um because she's not very i mean she's not the well she's not what a lot of them the american sort of idea of englishness mm. she has none of the trappings of of classic englishness <laughs> yes um she's yeah she's not like that at all so so i don't think yeah it's hardly even mentioned after you know no one says anything about her accent she's mm. also she's she does um merge she's she's a by very her nature is this this um ghostly her dad calls her a personified shrug she's just kind of <laughs> blends into the background and um so she does just just become part of her part of la very quickly mm. and it's only at the end that she kind of starts to find out who she really might be and and whether she wants to go back to england or stay or or how she actually wants to continue her life Living here yourself, did you have any moments where you felt like you wanted to merge? You know, I just want to. I, I don't know. Can you do the accent? Have you? Have you? Have you? Have you? Did you ever have those times when you're thinking, you know, maybe I just want to become part of this place and and see what that's like? Well, I'm very confused. I lived in Washington D.C. as a child, and used to have an American accent, um, and I now. I mean, I'm sometimes in London and I feel homesick and I'm a few miles from where I was born and a few miles from where my parents live, mm. but I feel homesick and I feel homesick for LA. Mm. Hmm. And I don't know how to spell center. I don't know whether <laughs> it's a sidewalk or a pavement no. or ladybirds or ladybugs. I actually had to look up. I was like, ladybirds, that's uh, <laughs> Lyndon Johnson's wife, right? And I mean, because you mentioned them in the book, but I learned something very important, I guess, is what my point there, that you guys have a different word for ladybugs. Yeah, yeah, mm. absolutely. Although, as I say, I, I'm not sure which one's which. <laughs> right, so I feel very much like I have, like, I'm sort of floating somewhere in the ocean. Mm. And and I did definitely think that I might much. Mm. That, I mean, you mentioned you do travel writing as well. That perspective of, of floating above nationality a bit, uh, that that always seems to help when writing about place. I mean, one of my friends who's, who's written so many books on countries and places and cultures, he's, he, he's British-born Indian family, splits his time between Santa Barbara, California and Nara, Japan. And I was like, that's that you, you had no choice, but to start writing about places, right? What do you, what do you think? Does that give you anything in terms of writing, strictly speaking about places? Absolutely. I'm very, very occupied with place. Mm. It almost comes before anything else Mm. and, and, and the atmosphere of a, of a situation. Well, I always moved around a lot. Um, My dad was a journalist and we moved to, I moved schools all the time. Mm. And partly at the beginning was just because, um, because we, we, we moved around a bit. But then after a while, I started doing it for no good reason whatsoever. And I went to about seven schools before high school. And then I lived in Beijing for a little while, uh, spent a little bit of time in New York and then moved to LA and I definitely I definitely like that feeling of being an outsider in a place Mm. and being able to see it and I miss it when I'm actually about to move to Berlin oh yes and where most people are outsiders from what I understand that these days they're from it's really we talk about London Los Angeles people from everywhere Berlin's even more so right um, I don't know it very well. I will okay. get back to you on that. I've spent a weekend there, mm. <laughs> um, so it's a bit of a, it's a bit of an odd one. Mm. So, what, what what brings you to Berlin? And in, in any case, um, I don't think. Well, I don't know if I'm going to write a novel about it, but I'm going to write another novel, mm. and um, just wanted to be somewhere else. I think I'd started to not see things as clearly. Hmm. How can you? How can you tell when you're not seeing things as clearly? I have the best ideas that I possibly have in hotel rooms. Mm. 
really, really like hotel rooms. Hotel bathtubs cure writer's block. Hmm. And it's that sense of being in a place that's familiar. It has all the trappings of, of your bedroom at home. It has the lamps and the beds and the bathtubs and the all these familiar things. Hmm. Yet they're props. They've been used loads of times before in different plays. And then you get in there and you can kind of create whatever theatre you want to, to make in um in in this familiar surroundings. And I think being in 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 a new city is is a bit like that. It just gives you the freedom. Your mind can find new ways to to think about things because you're not weighed down by all your possessions and the accumulation of, of whatever atmosphere you've created in, in, in your home. Hmm. Did your career writing, writing novels, writing fiction and travel, your two careers, fiction, writing, travel, writing, did they develop in parallel? <laughs> yeah, they did. Hmm. The first piece of travel writing I did was on LA. Hmm. Um, after, well, after you'd lived there during, before, after, hmm. um, I'd done lots of journalism, but I didn't think I'd done travel writing before then. And I, I pitched um, Alternative LA. So I pitched the idea that, that, yeah, everyone thinks of LA in this way, but actually go to Venice Beach and go to the freak show. Yes. Um, go to the Magic Castle. Mm. Go to the Korean day spa and see the almighty up Korean puppet show on the corner. <laughs> Indeed. And there's all this amazing stuff that happens in LA that, that um, is never quite on the radar of everyone who goes and stays in Chateau Marmont. <laughs> when you say everyone thinks of Los Angeles in a certain way, does that mean everyone, everyone, or Americans, English people? What? Uh, who? Who is everyone when you're thinking of everybody with the misconceptions? I suppose everyone is a terrible, terrible word to use. Not everyone. I mean, sort of the the classic, the cliche of LA, mm. which is what you read about in the magazines. So it's, yeah, the Kardashians and <laughs> and um, Paris Hilton and Scientology. Stuff in the media then. Stuff like in, in, the media. in the international media, they pick up certain things and run with them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And celebrity culture. I suppose celebrity culture is what I'm talking about. Yeah. Everyone being most people who pick up a pick up Grazia mm -hmm. will will see this version of LA that is just one very specific layer of the city. Mm -hmm. There is a, a documentary, I don't know if you've seen it, by Tom Anderson called Los Angeles Plays Itself about how Los Angeles appears in films often because, of course, so many are shot here or were. And the ways in which it is its geography and its realities are never quite honored by films. And how much of a priority was it for you writing The Pink Hotel to to honor the geography, where things actually are, who's actually where, and those sorts of the details a travel writer would, would need to pin down? I really wanted it to be accurate. Um, I wrote with, with a map. And I think... Um, <laughs> but my version of LA without a car was, you know, I didn't know every every bit. <laughs> like, you know, up in the hills, all of the confused, all the bits that buses don't go to. Right. Yeah, I went there like once or twice if people drove me. <laughs> so if my if I was drawing my um, imagine, imagination or my, my map of LA, um, there would be all these. But I, I tried to put, you know, when... He says, I love you in a Starbucks parking lot. That is a very specific Starbucks parking lot. And <laughs> it, the house that they live in is, well, basically where I used to live. And a lot of the plate, well, I mean, obviously the Cadillac, um, which is a real hotel in, in Venice Beach, is the Pink Hotel. Mm. Um, I tried to get all the bus routes in my head, even if I don't say what the buses are. You know, she's. I know what bus she's on. You um, had to live up to Richard Rayner's legacy because those are still the routes. When you read the book today, it's, you recognize them as like that's that one still goes on Venice Boulevard. Well done. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You mentioned writing with a map. There, 
there is again the issue of everybody having a different map in their heads of Los Angeles. And if you're driving around, I mean, you hear this from people, I'm sure you did. People will talk about how they won't go below the 10 freeway or how they live west of the 405 or something in relation to the 101. Bottom line is that they'll use those as psychological dividing lines in the city. And you or I or anybody else who doesn't drive here, you might say, I live on the red line subway or the purple or I take the 720 bus to Santa Monica, and that, that becomes those become your lines. Or you might divide it up ethnically, Koreatown's here, Little Armenia's here, Thai Town's here. What observations were you able to gather just over all of your history with this place of how many, how many mental maps there are? I mean, as many as people, probably, but of what, what surprised you about the way people map the city for themselves psychologically? Yeah, that's a very, very interesting question. Um... I had a friend who who had never been to the valley. Mm. And um I think I only went to the valley once. Um and yeah, people people do have and well it's the same in London. I mean northern it's just less less um less areas to deal with, but North London and West London they're like Montagues and Tabulates. They, <laughs> they won't talk to each other. And if you go to West London, it feels it feels like a whole different, a whole different world. But of course, in LA, it's that multiplied by I don't know how many by by a hundred. And and there are so many so many different different imaginary cities. And you, know, you could I mean, you'd have great fun making some sort of book on this. You could mm. do you could have maps of movie locations you could have imaginary cities from from the books you could get all the different novels that have been written about la from chandler to um to to well to absolutely everyone and chandler you could to you to chandler. yeah well i wasn't gonna say that but yeah <laughs> um and and map map their different their different cities and then you get a producer to map the places where he goes out. You could do all Bukowski's drinking places. It'd be fantastic. How do you think your characters have the city mapped out in their heads? You know, is that something you thought about ever writing other than your narrator has to learn the city? Did you have a sense of how other characters carved up the city for themselves? One of the things that the girls the girl finds in her um in the suitcase is this these photocopies of, of maps of america but also a couple of maps of la and one of them has a female body drawn in the in the in the roads and one of the the guy has you know where different parts of her body are and um remembers going to these places and and being you know kissing on the elbow of Los Angeles as a female drawn on a map. And um, they're kind of useless for the girl to get around with. <laughs> and she tries at one point. She uses the maps to to try and um, find her way around LA, which is utterly and completely useless. But <laughs> she is sort of, she does see LA as, as this human female with body parts. Um, as roads. Going through these items she has in the suitcase she steals, your narrator, as we've mentioned, encounters so many characters, many from many from parts of society, or many with who lead lives with qualities that would make readers initially believe they're sort of scuzzy types. And there are there are each every character has some quality of scuzziness that if you don't look past it, you'll you might write them off. Tell me about your relationship to the, the, the scuzzy in terms of writing characters. I don't know if that's a way you've put it to yourself, but everybody has that, that element. All the characters have some element that can seem loathsome if looked at at the right angle, right? <laughs> um, yeah, I suppose they do. I mean, the, the, her husband certainly does. But I mean, I hope that they all twist on some level and either in a scene or in the whole book. So the husband sort of twists over the whole book. Um, the first guy she, she 
rocks up to this um, bar dressed really awkwardly in her mum's try the first time she tries on her mum's clothes and this is a girl who's only ever worn tracksuit bottoms and um sweatpants to you guys and it's just sort of awkwardly in her mum's mini dress and she turns up at this this um bar to try and find a guy called august who is her mother's first husband and yeah he is he is sort of skanky he's he's a barman he's very beautiful but in slightly aging um, so he's sort of falling apart and she, he's really quite easily seduced by this awkward girl. And then of course, totally devastated <laughs> when the girl says, <clears throat> yeah, um, I'm your first wife's daughter. <laughs> um, but in the end, I hope is sort of quite sweet. He tries to help her and he goes from being turned on by her to being sort of strangely paternal towards her. And I, yeah. And, and David as well, um, who's the the main guy that the, the girl falls for. Yeah. He's a bit dark. He's an alcoholic. He's a paparazzi. Life has not gone as he planned. He dresses in, in curious, um, Curious bunch of, of tattered clothes and... He's already gone to seed at like 31, which, I mean, I'm 28, and I was reading that and I was like, geez, in in three short years, I could, could I be that guy? You know what I mean? It's it's There's a sense people are aging very quickly in, in the Los Angeles of this book, is there not? Um, well, he did booze a lot. I think so. you'd have to drink, you'd drink an awful lot. He doesn't remember like a large quantity, I think, of his... Hmm. Room. of his the last few years but i mean if you really went for it i'm sure you could i mean i'll, I'll give it my best shot yeah you can only try la i think mean, everyone says this but it's such a timeless place mm. you know it's, you can have breakfast at midnight and and everyone's nobody bats an eyelid and there are no seasons and there's this crazy flat light and nobody ages, of course, because <laughs> everyone's Botoxed. Well, not everyone. See, I'm using everyone again. Right. Um, it, is, it is optional to age, I guess. <laughs> yeah, optional aging. So maybe these people who, I guess, the characters in my book are not, you know, they're the dregs of LA. They are the the people who are outcasts. They have nothing to do with the film industry. They have nothing to do with um, society, really. They're the hoteliers, the... Mm skanky bars the the parking lots and tie town strip malls mm. are, are the dregs here much different from the dregs of london i mean in, in a sort of basic way or is it That's... just relation to the rest of society sorry to add that tag on as you answer <laughs> um well as i said i think the disparity between the idea of Los Angeles and the reality hmm. is probably, oh, the re yeah, is, is quite a yawning gap here compared to London, which doesn't have that cliche hanging over its head. Um, so nobody goes to London and thinks they can be anything they want to be. They don't think that they can be a movie star straight off the Greyhound. They're not given this, um, they're not given so much hope, which is is generated by all the advertising of all the romantic comedies and movies and everything else. Um, so maybe it seems that way. I'm sure it's not actually the case at all, but the light here kind of shows up the dirt. And, and hope is not a, it's not an essentially English quality, is it? <laughs> no, no. We, um, yeah, we don't approve of hope. <laughs> I was talking to an, an English an Englishman, a graphic designer who's actually been here about 30 years, so longer than I've been alive. He's been an Angelino, but he was saying his observation still seems to hold true. Eng English people are too pessimistic. Californians are too optimistic. So s there's some balance to be struck there. Maybe Maybe you can do it by being one and putting yourself in the context of the other. Do you think that's true? Um, yeah, I think we're becoming... I don't know. I would say that, that we're becoming, we're merging slightly, hmm. um, England and America and, and the, 
American. I mean, I remember coming here and, and saying, um, being very self-deprecating on a on a piece of writing. It was like not a personal statement, but that sort of thing. I think she didn't even was. It was a sort of for a, a CV or something. Mm. And, you know, I was being self-deprecating. Like we would never say I am awesome um, <laughs> or, or describe, you know, although it was a personal statement and we were, you know, I was trying to make myself sound great. I, you know, it was the English do it in a very contradictory way. And I remember giving it to someone and then being like, no, 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 you don't understand. Americans will believe what you write here. <laughs> so if you say this self-deprecating thing, they will believe it. Mm. Um, so I had to rethink and write, be much more um, on the ball. You didn't have to go through the same layers of protocol you would at home, where it's it's like you, you mean the same thing in either place, but you just express it differently depending on where you are. Yeah, hmm. um, I guess we don't say what we mean so much. Hmm. Well, yeah, I think it's it's mostly the self-deprecating thing. We're just we're trained not to be. I don't know, it's difficult to say. Now I make it sound like I'm being rude about Americans, which I'm really not. Well, um, it's, I mean, I think that Americans tend to like to hear that sort of thing. Like we, we, we like to be hurt. We like to hear that it's bad to say I'm awesome because we don't want to hear people say they're awesome either. It just sort of happens here. We're like, how did we get this way? I don't I mean, <laughs> do, do you know what I mean? Maybe the English also ask themselves, how did we get this way? Because it, it all happened a long time ago. We're just, we show up in these cultures when we're born. And there is always that sense if you get outside them a little bit, if you can float above them as an observer you, you always wonder how did these people get this way even if they're you even if they're you yeah absolutely hmm. um and i don't know how we became all <laughs> acerbic and and difficult and never ask for what we want and <laughs> terribly polite <laughs> <laughs> i want to know what is the appeal for you of a character like the, the narrator's mother in the pink hotel about whom we can learn much, the narrator can learn much, but we can never, we can never meet her because the narrator can never meet her. I was really interested in trying to construct a character without her ever walking on stage or on on um, on the page, and I think that's what the whole the whole book is about. Well, I mean, the theme is you know identity and and self construction, and she tries to to find out about her mother through what people say about her mother. And so she pieces together all these different puzzle pieces from her first husband describing meeting her in some like crazy town in the desert and the father and her her father saying something completely different mm. and how just how disparate identity can be and how if I was describing you, I would describe you completely differently to how, um, you know, your mother would describe you. But how it all, whether in the end you would get this summary of your character. Mm. And also she finds out through sort of physicality. She's never been touched. She's never, she doesn't understand affection on any level. And she, but she's really interested in the tangible and she well the things that she remembers about her mother are all physical she remembers how her how her legs felt when she grabbed her in the supermarket and how her hair dye smelt and she then sort of goes and the sort of sex element of the the book is is not about pleasure at all but about her trying to find this connection to her mother through the men who had touched her mother mm. and and that element of identity as well just sort of the physicality of of it trying to discover a person through what others say about that person or through things that person owned is that the same challenge do you think exactly the same challenge as finding out about a place by, by reading about it by seeing maps by looking at things from there and then hoping for the best as far as learning is it are those one and the same or is it does one being a person one being a place make them not really comparable to your mind i think they're definitely comparable mm. um and it is an interesting interesting comparison because i mean yeah if if 
One of my least favorite phrases in the world is be yourself. Oh, yeah. Like when you're going somewhere and someone says, no, calm down, just be yourself. And you're like, oh, for God's sake. I mean, there are like 20 myself. <laughs> um, At least. Yeah, like versions, not not that they're necessarily completely different, but mm. there are, you know, I definitely am acting differently sitting here with you than I would act with, you know, other people. And it's mm. still me, but there are these different versions and different people see me in different ways and <laughs> it was actually last night I was at Skylight Books um with Davy Rothbart who um runs Found magazine and um just just written a collection of essays called My Heart is an Idiot and the last one in it is very vaguely a version of me mm. and one of the most surreal 20 minutes of my life was last night when he read it Mm. while I was there and it sounds nothing like me I mean in the, <laughs> but it's a in a it's a version of me it's mm. some completely different and then I read the art of Le I'm sorry the pink hotel which is you know the narrator is certainly not me but it's again some alter ego some version of my subconscious mm. and just how different these two these two fictional characters walking around in different imaginations were mm. and just as LA, LA as we were saying people see it in such different ways and you can put on it whatever you you want to see and it is so many different things to so many different people so you know I am probably so many different things to so many different people I've been speaking here at Los Angeles Review of Books headquarters in Silver Lake, Los Angeles, California, with Anna Stothard, author of The Pink Hotel and two other novels, but this is the one newly available in America. She's a travel writer as well. Anna, thanks so much. Oh, thank you so much for having me. This has been the Los Angeles Review of Books podcast. I've been Colin Marshall. You can find much more on the web at lareviewofbooks.org. Thanks. <laughs>